So this episode, we begin to look at some of the earliest stages of human history. We've been working, generally speaking, from the present backwards in time, beginning by looking at the question of who do we living peoples come from, given all, all of our diversity and differences, ethnically, linguistically, culturally, what's the connections among us? And then we've been moving backwards in time and saying, how do we connect back to these ancient peoples? Could there be relationships between these ancient cultures and you and me that we didn't appreciate before? And my goal is partially apologetic, so that if you're a creationist, you'll have new tools to defend your faith. And if you're not a creationist watching, you'll have your views challenged. And that beyond all of the apologetic purposes, we'd be moved and prompted towards marveling at the stories of who we are and how we got here. And ultimately that we praise God for his sovereign rule of history. That's something every person needs to wrestle with by the time we finish this. We've seen all these connections. Is history one random linked chain of events that have no purpose, no goal? Or is there a sovereign hand that guides all this? And what does the scripture tell us? So my goal is that people would marvel. Now, if you look at the mainstream account for who we are and how we got here, the story of human origins begins primitive and brutish and animal-like. We're not humans at the beginning. The immediate ancestors to humans are ape-like creatures. They're not capable, they're not advanced, they're not intelligent by human standards, they're animals. And then at some point, about 200,000 years ago, roughly, on the savannas of Africa, the first anatomically modern humans arose. But then there's another big pause, so to speak. The next 100,000 years, again, roughly speaking, because these numbers change in the mainstream scientific model, for about 100,000 years, they just roam Africa. So to put this in perspective, we've been talking about heavily the history of civilization, the last, the most recent 4,000 years of history. Well, the 100,000 years of Africa is the history of civilization, 4,000 years, played over and over and over again. It's 25 times worth of that. So you, you get some sense then for the enormous amounts of time built into the evolutionary model. So eventually people come out of Africa, they have to deal with the Ice Age, especially if they're in the Northern Hemisphere. Some of them live in caves. It's still a primitive existence. Finally, maybe about 12,000 years ago, the agricultural revolution hits. This allows for the advancement of the human race. We see evidence for advancement in ancient structures like Stonehenge. The ancient Egyptians built the pyramids. We see cities like Petra. This is some of the old world examples. If you go to the New World, you see that pre-Columbian peoples building sites on top of mountains like Machu Picchu. But humanity doesn't really kick into an advanced stage until the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, where technology grows by gigantic leaps and bounds. And we see things like transatlantic ocean voyages and the beginnings of humans taking flight. And within short order, we come to our modern era where we can go pretty much anywhere we want to in the globe, whenever we want to, and we're even sending people into space. Some of you may have watched the recent SpaceX launch. So where do Neanderthals fit into this larger picture? They're viewed as and depicted as primitive. And the dates that are given to their origins and demise fit the ancient evolutionary timescale. They're typically depicted as arising hundreds of thousands of years ago, coexisting with anatomically modern humans and then going extinct, oh, maybe 30,000 years ago. So in this inevitable march of progress, they get stuck way back in the primitive era. So who were these people? Where did they come from? How did they arise? And what happened to them? First of all, and perhaps most importantly, is the question of the time scale. What do you do with that? Hundreds of thousands of years, of, of years ago, they arose. Tens of thousands of years ago, they disappeared. What is the timing? of their existence. These dates are obviously in conflict with the scriptures, and they're in conflict with the Y chromosome data we've been exploring. So just to stop for a moment and, and review what we've been discussing, the main tool by which we've been interrogating human history is the male inherited DNA, the Y chromosome. In episodes five and six, we looked at the reasons why it's this instead of other types of DNA, why it's this and not the $100 tests you can take through Family Tree DNA, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, one of these other commercial testing companies. This is the tool, the basis for exploring European, Chinese, African, Pacific, all these other places, that history, that's the basis for it. That data seems to conflict then with the state. And we've looked at the, the main tool. It has a basis in the existence of a clock. 
this Y chromosome is copied erroneously every generation. About two to three mistakes happen. And so that these, these differences add up over time, and the number of differences between you and me, between me and Ken, are a reflection of the time since we last had a common ancestor. So if Ken and I have a lot of differences at the Y chromosome level between us, our common male ancestor must be in the distant past. If we have just a few differences between us, our common ancestor must be more, much more recent than we thought. I don't actually know how close or distantly related we are, but the Y chromosome can tell us. Where does Neanderthal DNA fit though? You may have read in the news and seen announcements that we've got Neanderthal DNA. Maybe you've taken a DNA test and they say, oh, you're 4%, 2% Neanderthal. How does this fit? Well, let me tee it up this way. If you follow the creation evolution debate closely, you might have seen the question of Neanderthal DNA brought up as an argument against the young earth time scale. Why? If you look at the number of Neanderthal DNA differences between them and us, and us being modern humans, there are far more differences between us and them than between any two people alive today. And so if we use this concept of a genetic clock, we say, okay, how many differences exist between us? How many mistakes happen per generation? How can we dial the clock back to zero? How long does it take? Critics of young earth creation science would say you can't do that in 6,000 years, 4,500 years. There's too many differences to explain. So therefore your model is wrong. Well, what do you do with that? This is tied to this question of time scale. It's an argument for their ancient time scales. Now, young earthers have been saying, rightly so for many years, that Neanderthals are the descendants of Noah and his family. They're post-flood peoples who died out. So you need to explain them within 4,500 years. How do you explain these long branches? How do you explain all these DNA differences? Well, there's a similar principle at play here that we saw in our discussion of African DNA. So we saw in our discussion of these long branches among Africans, no one's actually directly measured the rate at which Africans mutate their DNA. It's all based on an assumption right now. They assume that the Africans mutate their DNA faster than others. And we've already seen probably the strongest smoking gun yet that they must mutate theirs faster. We're still waiting on someone to actually measure it. Well, Neanderthals are gone. We can't measure the father-son rate at which their DNA mutates. So that's one assumption they have to make, that their DNA clock ticks at the same rate that ours does, and that doesn't perhaps tick really fast and mutate really fast. My point is, this is very good indirect evidence that either the DNA is degraded and or their clock ticks at a different rate than ours does. Either way, it is not a legitimate argument against the young earth time scale. And what it also sadly means is that the DNA is not useful for further investigation. So we can reject this date as scientifically inaccurate. But what is the story of their time of origin and then the time of their demise? If this time scale is wrong, what can we do? And if we can't get at their DNA, what can we say about their history? Let's go back to this graph because there's a clue to Neanderthals in the DNA of modern people. It works like this. So if we draw a line right here to represent 1000 BC, I've been arguing that the overlap between the tan lines and the blue lines is really tight. Basically, this is an argument that when you're looking at human population history based on the Y chromosome, you're looking at something highly accurate. The match to the right of the purple line between the blue and the, and the tan gives me confidence that whenever I'm looking to the left of it, I'm looking at real history. In other words, the match to the right of the line argues that I can simply look to the left of the line and get information. So if I say, how many people were alive in 1200? or 1700 BC. I just draw a line over from the tan to this axis, and I can get the number of people alive. Now, this is a new concept that we'll dig into more in a moment. And I wanna show you how this is gonna bring us closer to the story of Neanderthals. So let's, let's take this in steps. If you didn't follow what I just did, well, just stick with me. We're gonna explain this in more detail in a moment. So the position where I think Noah is best supported is back here where there's two branches coming off of him, not three, and we'll discuss why there's not three. After about five to 700 years of people living after Noah, there's a whole bunch of branches that then start diversifying, as if there's a second Babel-like event where the major ethno-linguistic groups of the world start splitting and separating, going their separate ways. 
we saw in episode 20 that this has a very intriguing overlap with an event in Genesis 41 that sounds very global. The famine of Joseph's day, where he was made second in command of Egypt to preserve people, it says, from all countries, all lands. And this, the, the timing of this event is right in line with the timing of the event I just showed you. Well, what does this have to do with Neanderthals? Remember that I said the match over here between tan and blue means I can just use the tan by itself to figure out population sizes, which means I can go back from the Y chromosome and tell you, read off from this graph, how many people were alive in the entire planet during the famine of Joseph. This brings us closer to the question of Neanderthals. So 500, years post-flood during this time of Joseph's famine, how many people were alive? Well, we're looking at the Y chromosome male inheritance, so we can read off the number of males. I just double it to get the number of females to get the, the, the total population. Based on the Y chromosome data, even if you didn't follow exactly how they did it, my point is we can use genetics to learn how many people were alive on the planet at various points in history, even the most ancient points in history, which gets us then again close to this question of the entrance. Five to 10 million males, 10 to 20 million people total on the globe in the time of Joseph's famine. I'm gonna put pause on that for the moment and go even deeper in history. We've got still this outstanding question of what about the 500, 600 years before Joseph's famine? All we have is, this branch and this branch. We don't have other branches coming off. What can we say about that earliest point in history? Now, we're really pushing the limits of what these data can say. This is research in progress. What I want to show you, though, is one model that I think makes a lot of sense. So the, the question I'm now trying to answer is, what happened between Noah and really Babel and Joseph? There's several centuries in between them. How many people were alive at each stage? Well, we know from scripture, there were four males, and again, I'm talking males because we're thinking Y chromosome, four males immediately post-flood, Noah and his three boys. We've learned from the Y chromosome that at the time of Joseph's day, there were five to 10 million males. We don't really have Y chromosome data at the present to fill in the gap, but we can start running some models. One question we can ask is, what would it take to go from four males to the number of males alive in Joseph's day in the, in the low millions? Well, if you run the math, all you need is a growth rate of three to four kids per couple. That number is less than population doubling. So as an example, my wife and I have four kids. Our population is doubling. It's gone from two to four. If my kids grow up and they each have two kids each or four kids each they're in their families, doubling, doubling, doubling. That's less than population doubling. That's entirely reasonable is my point. It doesn't take much to go from Noah to Joseph in that time period. Now, you might say, well, I, my family doesn't, doesn't have population doubling. Maybe you only have one sibling, two siblings. Maybe you're the only child. You look at other places around the globe. Maybe it's not population doubling. But, ah, I don't know what I think of it. My point is that it's plausible. Whether or not it's probable is something we can evaluate with relevant data. And the most relevant data are the data that come from the historical record of the immediate aftermath of Babel, the list of peoples in Genesis 10. Genesis 10 gives us genealogies of Noah's son's generation, then how many sons they had, and how many sons some of their offspring had. And if you take the average of Shem, Ham, and Japheth's lineages, immediately following the flood, they were not undergoing population doubling. They were undergoing something much faster. The average number of kids per couple in Genesis 10 is seven to eight, not three to four. So when I say, what you need as a, as a minimum to go from Noah to Joseph is something even less than what the scripture says is going on. Now, remember that when we're at Joseph's time, we're talking about a famine. Famines have this nasty habit of killing people because they die of starvation. So what may have happened is that there was rapid reproductive growth following the flood, and the famine of Joseph's day put a big damper on that and may have killed off some people. The theological point, of course, we see in Genesis 41 is God preserving the lineage of Jacob because of his promise to Abraham, but everyone else is benefiting. Some may not have benefited. Who knows? The point is this is extremely plausible. It works very well, and it's even less than what Genesis 10 is saying is going on. Okay, Neanderthals. These people appear to have migrated away out from Babel and died out before the famine. Okay, well, what does that tell us? Back to the Native Americans. We said these so-called primitive-looking peoples are that way 
not because they've been living in Stone Age technology for thousands of years and always been primitive. They were highly advanced, but their civilization collapsed. And those we see today are the survivors of a recently shattered culture. The shattering came about because of the arrival of Europeans, diseases, enslavement, and so forth. Those are not applicable at the dates we're looking at for Neanderthals. However, in episode 20, we looked at other events, biblical events, such as caravan, the migration of people to Egypt at the time of Joseph's famine, and conquest, as well as confusion, the Tower of Babel, conquest being the mixing and migration and pillaging of the peoples that's happened ever since Babel. Looking at Israel's history, we saw that point. All of those would be at play. All three of those events, confusion, caravan, conquest, have by their nature the potential to upend and shatter a civilization and culture. The Neanderthals appear to have survived Babel. Now, the judgment purpose of Babel was to shatter civilizations. That's what God said. He said they're building a tower to heaven. Look at what they're doing. What's going to stop them from doing anything further? Let's confuse their languages. It's to inhibit what they were doing. That's the judgment. It's been a very effective judgment. Part of the reason I think we haven't had technological progress like we've had, except until the last few hundred years, is because we can't speak to each other. We've had to recover some of that lost knowledge. It's taken a long time. God's judgment in Genesis 11 has lasted thousands of years. It's going to affect the Neanderthals and other cultures. The famine would affect them. The dates seem to be like, it looks like they died out before the famine. So another possible explanation for their demise is conquest. We looked at the history of Israel to see the sad history of their conquest by the peoples because of their sin, God's divine judgment. So there's a divine hand, but we also know that it's also a consequence of human sin. In Genesis 10, Nimrod is called a mighty hunter before the Lord. Do you think conquest set in centuries after Babel? Where did conquest start happening right away? Were human hearts any different from before the flood, where they were thinking of new ways to do evil and kill each other? I don't think so. I don't think history bears that out. I don't think the scripture bears that out. We all have the same depraved heart that only Christ can redeem. So could Neanderthals have died out at the hands of fellow Babel survivors? I think it's entirely plausible. Did conquest, as a rule of thumb, kick in as soon as Babel ended? I think so. And if you're thinking about the population sizes, so if if in Abraham's day, there's only 50,000 people, and one of the subgroups within this 50,000 decides they're going to go conquer the others, That conquest might not be just the overtaking of one group by another. It might lead to the extinction of one. So those are all things to keep in mind when we think about the Neanderthals. Today's Native Americans, so-called primitive peoples, we saw in previous episodes, apparently wiped out those who were here first. And now today, they've been nearly wiped out by those who came in after, the Europeans. What about the Neanderthals? They survived Babel. Did they survive the conquest that likely ensued thereafter? I want to return to this larger point, though, of the inevitable march of progress. The animals are often stuck back here. And there's this natural, well, they look dumb, old, primitive. What do we do with that? Even if we convert their time scale and put them in a biblical context, yes, there's this possibility that they were wiped out by someone around them. Maybe they succumbed to the effects of the Ice Age. We have a temporal context in which to place their origins and existence. What about this idea, though, of an inevitable march of progress? Well, here's, I think, a larger point that's not been made before that I think is emotionally satisfying and biblically consistent. What do we do with the fact that there's, yes, unambiguous, gigantic leaps of progress in the last few centuries? Why wouldn't we extrapolate that into the past? Well, we've already seen, based on Native Americans and in Scripture, that catastrophes can take an advanced people and make them look primitive. Same thing can apply to the Neanderthals. And so history is filled with the rise and fall of peoples based on conquest. And your ability to survive a conquest or not do it has a relationship to the size of your peoples. Some of it, of course, there's a disease role. But if you're a large population and this tiny minority comes and tries to wipe you out, chances are the larger population is going to win. And the smaller population is going to have to revert to a primitive state because they've just been destroyed. We've been looking at human population history heavily over and over in each episode. And what's intriguing to me is the rule of thumb is fairly level growth, even growth for thousands of years, and a sharp uptick in the last few hundred. One that seems to coincide with the leaps and bounds of progress that we've seen. So this seeming move from primitive to complex to me is not the inevitable march of progress, 
It's the inevitable march of populations. It's not some evolutionary story of how we keep advancing. People are advanced and then they go primitive and advance and go primitive depending on who conquered them and who else they can conquer. And the recent uptick seems to be in byproduct of just how many people there are on this globe. We've had a sharp uptick in peoples. Knowledge has increased, has been sharing, and there's so many more hands to be put to the task of advancing technology. This is not some evolutionary story. Human history is a reflection of changes in population growth. And Neanderthals are at the earliest stages when population sizes were small and the chance of going permanently extinct because it got wiped out were much higher.